it's time to talk about rules and tips for advocates who wish to become involved in public policy change. For me, the critical starting point of any advocacy activity is to recognize how important an individual voice is in policy debates in the state of New Hampshire. We are a small state. All of us have relationships across many sectors. The businesses that we, that we engage with, our kids' soccer coaches, our employers, nonprofit boards that we sit on. New Hampshire is a small state, lots of relationships. New Hampshire's legislative process encourages direct advocacy and participation. We have 400 members of the House, 24 members of the Senate. They serve two-year terms for $100 a year. They live and work in the communities. We see them all the time. And third, our process is an open and transparent one that encourages people to participate in the process. So as you think about becoming an advocate, remember how important it is that you have your voice heard and what a difference it makes. Now, moving on to the rules. I guess, for me, the most important phrase is simply that relationships matter. Everything else is secondary. When you think about being an effective advocate, you think about building relationships not just with the policymakers, but also with stakeholders, other groups that may share your views on particular issues. New Futures works regularly with the medical community, the education community, the law enforcement community. Those are people that share our views on a lot of issues. So we have, we need to build relationships not just with senators and representatives, but with stakeholders. And in building these relationships, we recognize that they are long term. These are not short term relationships. These are relationships that are built over time and they're built on mutual respect and integrity. As you think about forming a relationship with a policymaker, remember that you can be a resource to that person. It is very likely, given the fact that your representative, a member of the House or Senate that you vote for, may not serve on a committee that cares about the issue that you've come to them with. You may come to them with a drug and alcohol question and they serve on science, technology, and energy. So they are likely to know less about the issue that you care about than you do. And so when you talk to them, you need to recognize that you can be a resource to them and be clear about that, that you can help them with information and personal stories and connections. Now on to the rules for successful public policy advocacy. The fundamental rule is that relationships matter, everything else is secondary. The formation and maintenance of positive working relationships, not just with legislators, not just with senators and representatives, but with stakeholders that share your views, is the most important thing to do to be an effective advocate. So then the question becomes, how do you form these effective relationships, these positive relationships? And there's really no magic to it because it's like forming any positive relationship. These are personal relationships, particularly around issues with substance use. It's very rare to talk to a policymaker who doesn't have his or her own personal story of a family member or friend with a drug or alcohol problem. So, you can form personal relationships, you can listen to their stories, you can understand what motivates them as a policymaker. At the same time, you can share your own personal stories. A second factor in building personal relationships with legislators is to recognize that these, really, these relationships are long term. Although a third of the House and Senate turn over every, every two years, that means two thirds of the House and Senate stay in their positions for a number of years. And so you are going to work with these folks over a time period. And since in many cases, legislative change is incremental, 
you make a little progress one year and then the next year you make a little bit more progress and then you make a little bit more progress until you get to the goal that you ultimately want. So in order to make that work, you have to look at these relationships as long term. And you have to recognize that people who disagree with you on a particular issue are likely going to agree with you down the road on something else. So another rule here is never burn your bridges. A phrase that I got from a woman who used to serve as the deputy speaker a number of years ago, she had a wonderful turn of phrase. She said, in New Hampshire, you need to remember that the food chain is round. And what that means to me is that you treat everyone with respect and concern, regardless of whether they agree with you on an issue or not, because you are going to see those people again and you will need to work with every single one of them to accomplish your goals. Finally, um, not finally, almost finally, as is true with any strong long-term relationship, it is based absolutely on integrity. If you are asked by a legislature about an issue and you don't know, tell them that. Don't pretend you know. If you misrepresent something, trust me, they will find out and they will remember that. And if you promise to do something, get them information, attend a hearing, attend a meeting, and you don't do that, then that affects your ability to be an effective advocate. And the final thing I'll add here is that remember that you, know, you may know more about an issue than they do. You can offer yourself to be a resource to them so that you can help them understand an issue that they may not fully, they may not have the background to understand. So you, you can offer yourself as a resource. And finally, something that we always forget to do enough, which is to thank them for their service and for their assistance to you. You have no idea how few times people take the time to thank their legislators for activity on a particular bill. It means a lot to them and it helps cement that relationship. For those of you who might be inclined to communicate with your representative or senator by email, this is the basic rule for email communication. Legislators get an enormous number of emails from people that are not their constituents. In other words, people that don't vote for them. And they also get an extraordinarily large number of emails that are of standard canned language. So if you are going to communicate with your legislator through email, then you need to make sure that you're in your subject line of your email it references that you are a constituent and that in the body of your email that you include your address and phone number so that they can verify that and that you use your own story or your own personal reference that you do not whole cloth take text from an action alert or something of that type. In terms of tips in dealing with legislators. Um, if I'm going to speak to a legislator, I will generally prepare my remarks. I will think about what I want to say to make sure I'm clear. And particularly if I'm calling them and speak or speaking to them in person, I will make sure I script myself out. And I start by saying who I am and why I'm calling and if I have a story to tell about why I'm asking them to do something, I will explain that. So, for example, I would start a call to my representative by saying, Hello, my name is Tricia Lucas. I live in Manchester and I work I, and I vote in Ward 2. That tells my legislator that I'm a constituent, that I vote for them, and that I have, and that I am interested in this issue. And I will say, and I'm calling you about a particular piece of legislation that you are going to be voting on in the next several days. And I am asking you to vote for this piece of legislation for the following reasons. I emphasize that I'm a constituent. I'm clear about what I'm talking to them about. And I'm very clear about what I'm asking them to do. I would conclude that conversation by saying thank you 
for your service as a legislator, and would it be all right if I follow up with you? I consider it to be completely appropriate to call legislators at home. If I do that, I generally ask them, is this a convenient time to speak with you? And one tip that I give to people who might be a little nervous about calling a legislator is you might pick a day when you think that they're not home, and that way you can practice just leaving them a message. But make sure if you do that, you leave your telephone number so that they can call you back. I think the final thing that I would like to share with you is, in addition to talking to legislators about particular pieces of legislation and giving you tips on that, is to highlight some of the other things that you can do as an advocate. Because remember, advocacy is a very broad concept and it involves education, it involves community organization, it involves building coalitions and stakeholder groups. So if you care about a particular issue, you might speak to a Rotary Club or a PTO or another service club. You might bring together a coalition of people to try to come up with a solution to a problem. You might do research on an issue. You might engage the media by a letter to the editor, um, an op-ed, replying to an online version of an article so that you can begin to educate the broader public about issues that matter to you. We've talked about a number of different ways that you as an advocate can become involved in making positive policy change. I want to close with the fact that what we hear most frequently from legislators is that it's the telephone calls that make the greatest difference. If you ask a legislator how many times they get phone calls on a particular bill, they will tell you it's rare to get more than two. So you can get a sense of how important a telephone call might be. And so we would urge you to think about that as a principal tool for your advocacy. And I close with the final, the way I started, which is your voice as an advocate makes a difference here. Without your voice, public policy change in this area is not going to happen.